I'm joined by the Reverend Jonathan Aitken, former war correspondent, businessman, MP, cabinet minister, media magnate, and what people used to call man about town. In his own words, he has a racier past than most priests. He's also spent time in prison. Um, Jonathan Aitken, you celebrated your 81st birthday this week. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, You've done it all. When, when you're wearing the flak jacket in Vietnam and Biafra, did you ever imagine that you'd end up <laughs> with a dog collar? <laughs> Absolutely not. Never crossed my mind. Uh, and um, it's one of the mysteries and miracles of life, but I've never been happier, never been more fulfilled than doing what I do, which is basically prison chaplaincy, and I'm an assistant minister in a couple of churches and lots of other ministry. Give us a clue about the mystery. I mean, how do you get from there to here? God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders oh, I, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> I thought you'd say that. But I think if there is any uh, good um, uh, clue, uh, Martin Luther once said, it is in our pain and in our brokenness that we come closest to Christ. And obviously... Prison and catastrophic failure surrounding it was a breaking experience, but not a totally breaking experience. And I at least started to think more, pray more, and things then just moved in ways that I can't understand. I mean, after I left prison, I went to the one place in Britain which had worse food and worse plumbing than a prison, which was an Anglican theological college called Wycliffe <laughs> Hall, Oxford. And I did study and got very interested but I was sure I was not right to be a priest, but uh, things changed. Was there what, I guess, uh, you would call, if you were giving a sermon, an epiphany? Was there a moment where, you know, the light shone down and you thought, I'm now going to be a different person? No, it was much more a stumbling, ducking it, avoiding it, not quite wanting to go there kind of journey. Uh, but in the end, when God calls, he calls. And um, if there was rather an amusing moment when things really changed, I was resisting being a prison chaplain. And someone came to see me and said, oh, you should see what the England cricket captain had to say about being a prison chaplain. I said, Ben Stokes, what has he done? He meant the English cricket captain in 1883, who was somebody <laughs> called C.T. Studd, who wrote a little verse which went, some like to live within the sound of church and chapel bell, I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And as soon as I heard that, having been in prison and knowing how hellish they can be, and knowing, what, and I'd done a lot of sort of prison voluntary Christian work, I said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. And then a bishop recommended me and so on. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's a calling and you can't resist it in the end. Is there anything particular about the way you do your prison ministry. We'll talk a bit about why you got there, but uh, what's special about it? Well, this week I've been two days in prisons, one in Elmley in Kent and Pendleville, where I usually am in London. And if I'm any use at it, I think I'm more used because I was a prisoner. I mean, occasionally I say to somebody I'm praying with, you know, I was a prisoner too, and they express it. Uh, astonishment that my Eton and Oxford accent could possibly have ever landed me up in prison and so on. Uh, but because I understand the way prisoners feel, understand about their brokenness, I think I'm <clears throat> maybe a bit more effective as a prison chaplain and as a pastoral helper and advisor. Mm -hmm. And that's a strength. Uh, people of my and your vintage know what your story was and what the, the moment that you changed from this glamorous uh, politician, don't have many of those these days, future prime minister and all of that. Uh, but let's have a look back at the, I guess the moment for the public mind, Jonathan Aitken became somebody else. Here in Britain, we have both the best media in the world and the worst media in the world. That small latter element is spreading a cancer in our society today, which I will call the cancer of bent and twisted journalism. The malignant cells of that bent and twisted journalistic cancer include those who engage in forgeries or other instruments of deceit to obtain information for the purposes of a smear story. We don't have to go over all the details. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as it turned out, 
do you uh, were convicted in the way of your own instrument of deceit, uh, perjury and so on. I've always wondered, what made you do that? Presumably you must have known that it wasn't, it wasn't going to get, essentially you weren't going to get away with it. Well, I'm always ashamed when I watch that clip you just played. It's often r repeated and uh, feel very sorry and repent about it. Um, what made me do it? I think pride and vaingloriousness saying, yes, I can tough this one out. I can get away with it. And uh, th even though that clip is absolutely wrong, at the same time, there were quite bad things being done. I mean, forgeries and so on. Uh, and I was angry, um, always foolish to be angry. And so I re regret it. I can't say much more than that. This week, we um, heard that the Anglican clergy themselves no longer believe that Britain is um, a Christian country. Uh, only a quarter will say that it is. Uh, some, you know, two-thirds say historically, but not, not now. Is that, is that disappointing to you, or is it realism? I think it's both. Uh, first of all, um, it's a slightly dodgy and limited survey, but even so, of course it's true that church-going is in decline. I think... Ernest Chris... says that fewer than one in ten people go to church every week. Well, I'm going from here to a church in Notting Hill where I'm an assistant uh, priest, and I know it'll be more or less full of about 130 people, all young. Uh, I see constantly churches that are thriving. Also, while Christian churches are not uh, anything like as full as we'd like, Christian ministry is pretty busy. I've been talking about prison ministry, but there are lots of other activities which go on. For example, I'm on Monday uh, leading a share and prayer group of Christian civil services. Day after day, I'm almost busier than I've ever been in ministry, part of which is church. Uh, and, and also, don't be too parochial about this. I mean, if you take the big view, <coughs> God remains... Uh, faith in him rises and falls over the millennia. And right now, the Christian religion is actually the fastest growing religion in the world by a country mile. I mean, thanks to Africa and Asia, we're weak in, Eastern, in, in um, Western Europe. But, I mean, <coughs> God goes on and flourishes. Um, God may go on and flourish more widely, but there are some people who don't believe that there's much space for God in politics these days. Um, do you think that we are in a different place than when you were an MP and a cabinet minister in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, in the relationship between the church and the state? I think, that again, the church and state relationship rises and falls. I mean, the bishops are perhaps more talkative in the House of Lords uh, and often talk in good sense in the House of Lords than they've almost e ever been. But um, <clears throat> the House of Commons <clears throat> is a <clears throat> slightly perplexing place. There are because quite a lot of Christian activity, prayer groups, communion services, don't write politicians off as having no faith. I think it's a good thing that, unlike in America, where I'm off on a preaching in prison or next week, but politicians wear their faith on their sleeves in America. Here we, I think, rather decently say it's, a, on the whole, private matter. We don't expect politicians to, uh, to do, do a lot God. Of, to do God. But they may do God in their own hearts. Uh, well, we have a Prime Minister now who is pretty open about his commitment yes. to faith. He celebrates uh, Hindu rituals and so on. Have you got any advice for him? I He's got 12 <clears throat> months. I wouldn't presume to give him advice, but I think he's doing a very competent job. Uh, and even though events sound like today are probably moving against him, um, my first job in politics would be a junior speechwriter <laughs> for Alec Douglas Hume. When he arrived, everyone said he hasn't got a hope. He actually nearly won the election uh, in 64, came very, very close to beating Harold Wilson by three seats. So. Politics is a strange game, and there's many, many uncertainties. So Rishi Sunak might do a lot better than people are thinking today. Yeah, though I, I suppose, um, again, this is men of our vintage talking. Wilson then got a landslide in 66. Yeah. But I hear, the, I hear the message here. Um, while there is life, there is hope. 
good Christian message too. <laughs> Jonathan Aitken, thank you very thank much you. for being with us.